Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the Vision for Life podcast. The basis for everything we discuss on this podcast is God's revelation of himself to us. God's revelation surrounds us. His revelation of himself brings wisdom and clarity to those who lack the ability to see. It provides us with a unique spiritual light that allows us to see things we couldn't previously, unaided by God's word and by God's spirit. And Adam is joining me today. Adam is our pastor of worship and arts here at Fellowship. Adam, welcome. Hey, Autumn. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive in on what is worship today with you. Mm -hmm. So thanks for bringing me along. Yeah, we're asking the question together, what is worship? That's just a small question. Yes. I'm sure we'll be able to cover a lot of ground. This will be easy. <laughs> um, our notion of worship is probably formed more by kind of cultural understandings that mm -hmm. we fall into or just religious environments in which we've been raised or have become familiar rather than probably a holistic biblical understanding of worship. At least I know that's been true in my own life and understanding. I was raised in the church, kind of had this idea of worship as something that we do on Sunday mornings yep. when we gather and sing and learn. That was really how it kind of existed in my mind for a long time um, yeah. because it was just an understanding I had inherited. Yeah, it, it's become kind of one of these words, if you've been following Jesus for any length of time, um, that kind of can mean something different to different people. And I think there's sort of a general understanding of what we mean when we reference the word, and yet people use it kind of differently all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you will hear people reference uh, worship primarily through the lens of like Sunday morning, but some people just mean singing, and some people are applying it to other parts of their life outside of Sunday morning. And so it's kind of one of those words that... Um, it's like a suitcase term a little bit. It kind of means different things to different people. It carries with it uh, a certain weight for some people that mm -hmm. it doesn't carry with others. Yeah. And so it kind of goes a bunch of different directions. Yeah, and it has these, uh, it's used sort of in pop culture in a way that can imply a really strong desire or even a kind of lust or something that has control over you. So worship can have both positive connotations or sort of just shallow understanding and sort of negative implications, I think, in the way it gets utilized sometimes in just cultural references outside of kind of faith communities or outside of a religious environment. Um, and then another way I think that we fall into a sort of understanding about it is through uh, just some of the songs we sing that we even reference as worship yeah. songs. I think one popular song that comes to mind as soon as I think of worship is the Here I Am to Worship Here by Hillsong. That's right. Um, and it says, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. And so that reinforces some of these just sort of cultural understandings that we pick up on. Yep. It's just kind of this idea that I wasn't worshiping and now here I am. Yep. Now I'm, it's like a light switch. <laughs> I turned it on. Uh, uh -huh. But I think that does have a way of shaping how it is that we relate to God. And so mm. those little songs, sometimes they stick in our minds because they're popular for a season or whatever, but they tend to be long-term kind of these strangely sort of shaping liturgies of our life and how it is that we, we tend to think of uh, interacting with God responding to God, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that in contrast to what we've just referenced, in contrast to a sort of instantaneous, all right, here I am, I've shifted my heart now into worship mode, or in contrast to maybe greater bigger cultural references about worship being something that simply controls you by way of mm -hmm. a desire that you have or a longing that you have. Um, the basis for worship 
in scripture that is given to us is really, it's based on the worth of God and that he is separate from anything else in creation, that he is holy and unique. And so over and over the reminders to worship him, to have this sort of heart orientation and life that is postured towards him are based on that. It's a continual appeal over and over to God's worth, to his uniqueness and holiness. And so one passage that you and I were talking about, Adam, that I'm going to read now is Psalm 86, starting in verse 8. It says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. So in a moment, we're going to jump into a pretty thorough (laughs) uh, (laughs) definition of worship. But based on this passage, a simple definition that we can begin to work from is that worship is our response to who God is. That's right. And to the ways, all the ways he loves us. So take take it away. Guide us into this yes. bigger definition. Well, that's really helpful because we need the word to inform our view of worship. And like you were saying, we want to acknowledge kind of all the different influences that we have as a culture mm-hmm. that are trying to shape how it is that we see and understand our relationship with God and how we how it is that we honor Him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we want to start with Scripture. We want to go back to Scripture. We want that to be... Uh, really where we're pulling our understanding of worship uh, from. Um, That being said, we have this really thorough definition provided by D.A. Carson. So we're going to pull it from Scripture and from D.A. Carson. That's right. We're going to do both. But D.A. Carson also probably pulled it from Scripture. Yeah, I mean, I think so much of this is (laughs) informed by the Word, and and that'll come out when you hear the definition. But um, he contributed to a book. There's a handful of authors that contributed to a book called Worship by the Book. Mm. Um, And so I'm going to paraphrase his definition because it's really, really long. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of break down some significant parts of his definition that I think will help give us some handles as we consider uh, this question, what is worship? So here it is. Worship is the proper response of ascribing all honor and worth to the Creator God precisely because He is worthy. This side of the fall, human worship of God properly responds to the redemptive provisions that God has graciously made. Worship is God-centered and Christ-centered, empowered by the Spirit, and in line with the stipulations of the new covenant. It manifests itself in all our living, finding its impulse in the gospel, which restores our relationship with our Redeemer God, and therefore also with our fellow image bearers and co-worshippers. Such worship therefore manifests itself both in adoration and in action, both in the individual believer and in corporate worship, which is worship offered up in the context of the body of believers, who strive to align all the forms of their devout ascription of all worth to God with all the new covenant mandates and examples. Hmm. So that's it. (laughs) That's it. Yep. (laughs) Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, This is actually really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's incredibly thorough. And I think if you take nothing else away from today, the first line of the definition is really helpful. Worship is the proper response of ascribing all honor and worth to the creator God precisely because he is worthy. Mm -hmm. So um, I love this definition. I'm I'm gonna grab a a couple sentences out of here and just try to unpack those a little bit. Um, Number one, worship is all of life. There's a quote in this definition that says, worship manifests itself in all our living, Mm -hmm. meaning that we have the opportunity to worship God with everything in our life. It doesn't mean that we do this by default. It's just that we simply can do all things unto the Lord. There is a wholeheartedness that is is really required of us, but 
it means that we have to live intentionally for this to be true. Um, this is why daily prayer and prayer over all things not only aligns our hearts with God's will for our lives, but it also reorients us in a posture of worship towards God to see all that he has given us as a way of worshiping him and magnifying his worth. So I think that's the first thing that I would start with. Worship manifests itself in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. In all our living. And it's helpful too for me to consider that term worship manifests itself in all our living and to think of worship not necessarily as worship of God, the creator God that Carson is invoking in this description, but as worship as something that we as humans are created to do. And therefore, we will evidence worship of something. That's right. In all of our living, whether it is worship of God or of something else, because many, many things can take that place. We can be worshiping self or money or success or productivity or our children or that's right. Some image of that we would like to achieve. Any of these things can very easily fill in that spot. So worship of whatever it is will manifest itself in all of our living anyhow. <laughs> and an orientation, therefore, towards God, as you were just describing a posture of worship towards God. Yes. Should then manifest itself in our day-to-day lives. Yeah, I think of, just to kind of piggyback on this idea, I think of the example of like um, doing the dishes. So I can do those in a way that honors my wife and supports our family Mm -hmm. and creates some type of, though be it small maybe, flourishing in our house Mm -hmm. with with a clean kitchen. I can do those things in a way that is servant hearted, that is... um, uh, with real care for uh, uh, for our house and for our, um, and, and really kind of produces like this sort of stewardship, mm-hmm. um, or I can do it with contempt and bitterness mm-hmm. and frustration. And I've had a long day, and my heart can be oriented in that way. I can do it and be mad about it. I can carry a grudge, and then I can let that grudge sort of influence my relationships and my interactions. And so, our posture and how we think about our lives and how we think about what God has done and and how he's kind of provided for us um, really has this immense impact on how it is that we just kind of uh, see uh, worship or how we Mm -hmm. even see and understand um, some of the smallest parts of our day. Mm -hmm. Um, We tend to think of worship as these kind of big moments, potentially singing these grand songs or giant acts of service. And often... God is is meeting us in these really small moments. And so, um, Mm. yeah, posture is incredibly important here. So you can show up and do the dishes and say, here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, But it's so true that these are the sorts of tasks and items that fill a lot of our time. And in that, the way that you go about doing the dishes and your heart orientation in it will actually evidence what it is that you are worshiping in that moment. Yes. Your loves will come to the surface. Yes. All right. Can we look at the second one here? Yes. Yeah. What What of this, um, of Carson's definition, would you like to pull out next? Well, so the next piece I'd like for us to focus on is this idea of worship is active. So to kind of take a quote out of his definition. He says that worship manifests itself both in adoration and in action. That worship, another quote is, that worship is the proper response of ascribing all honor and worth. Mm-hmm. And the word ascribe means to that we attribute. And attribute is to speak up. It's to give credit. This means that our worship is active. It's not a passive behavior that we simply get to check the box on. Um, We should be praising the Lord with thoughts that honor and glorify his name, but active worship can be and should be so much more. So God shows us why he is worthy, not with mere thoughts and ideas, but with real words and tangible actions. The action of sending his son in space and time to live a perfect life, die a death we deserve, taking our sin, 
to be resurrected into a body that can never die, and then finally ascended to the right hand of the Father, our response should be a holistic one, worshiping God in thought and in action, in word and in deed. Without active expressions of worship, be it in service to one another, in our work, in how we raise our children, how we love our neighbors, or in singing, our affections uh, will be dulled and our love of God will be shallow. So it's kind of this idea that we tend to think of worship sometimes, and the reason I wanted to highlight this is because we tend to think of worship sometimes as this sort of passive thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think when we, oftentimes when we talk about worship in a Sunday morning context, we tend to go, like, I I hear this and I even do this, um, like, uh, hey, did you go to worship today? Mm -hmm. Or uh, I, I didn't. I didn't get to attend, attend worship. Yeah. There's there's almost sort of this naturally kind of passive like passive uh way of thinking about hmm. um about worship especially on a on a Sunday morning. And That's true because most of us just show up and then are led through something. Yes. So the majority of us who are attending a Sunday service gathering would are not preaching or not leading right. singing. And so we show up in sort of a receiving kind of mindset that we're being led through something. And that can lead to this passive understanding of participating in worship in a way that is, I'm listening to what is being taught or I'm joining in this singing, but someone else is leading it or leading me through it. Yeah. And often, I mean, Paul says like, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And mm-hmm there is a piece of that where you are sitting and you are receiving. And, but I, I think that can become our whole view and our whole understanding of what it means to worship on a Sunday morning. And what Carson is saying here is that actually proper worship um, is, is active. It's alive. It's living and breathing and it requires something of you. Um, so it's not, It's not an activity that we just take in. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we just think about, but it's something that we are an active participant in. Hmm. We see that in that passage in Psalm 86 that we read earlier, that the response was a request from the psalmist that God would teach him his ways. And over and over throughout the whole of scripture, that same pattern is repeated, a recognition of God's worth requires a response of aligning not only one's heart, but one's actions with God, as you were mentioning here. It's both adoration and action. We see one example of this, of many, is in Deuteronomy 10, 12. They praise God for what he has done, for the mighty works that they've seen him do, what he has done on their behalf, adoration. And then in verse 12, it says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. So that's the action, the Mm -hmm. response that is active. And then it shifts back actually to a recognition of of God's worth and ascendance. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. So both are paired there in this passage and in many passages, adoration and action. Yeah, and this is a little bit of a tangent. And of course, I'm going to use singing as an example, but there's something that happens um, to our affections, like to our loves, the things that that um, that really kind of drive uh, our lives when we uh, are engaged, kind of not just our minds but our bodies in mm-hmm. worshiping God. And so, if we think about singing, you know, we are voicing audibly. You know, we are made as people in the image of God, which is no just accident. Mm-hmm. So we are not to live lives that are like kind of this compartmentalized existence where we think about worshiping God or we consider the ways of God, but we don't ever actually do anything with those. Mm -hmm. We're actually meant to kind of be integrated kind of whole beings. And so part of what that means is like God has given us 
he's given us tongues to sing and we're commanded to sing in scripture and and so we're expressing it's very it's this active idea we're expressing these truths of who god is we're ascribing uh all glory and praise and honor and what's happening there is this is sort of the grand mystery of music but god is now taking those truths that we are expressing and he's using those to stir our affections for him which is rooting us deeper into the love of god making us actually in turn want to worship him more and so mm-hmm. it's sort of this reciprocal kind of thing that happens uh, within us where by worshiping god we want to worship him more mm-hmm. And which is just this incredibly powerful reality of our lives with God. But the key is we have to do it. And that's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it would be so, I mean, I, I like to think that like, well, I, I know I love the Lord. I, I have those thoughts. I want to pursue God with all of my life. And yet, um, God is inviting us, commanding us actually even to sing and it's mm-hmm. in in these ways that we engage our worship, that we make it active in deed, not just in word, but not just in thought, but in deed, where God starts to take those things and root us in himself more and more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find that to just be like so overwhelming and so incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. So to someone who would say, music just isn't really my thing, or I'm not good at singing, or they don't like to hear themselves sing, you are gently, kindly encouraging them to participate because in acknowledging that God has commanded us to sing, we actually can experience more of his presence, stepping into a space in which we may still be uncomfortable, but through it, through engaging that what some of us may be uncomfortable with, God can actually use that to grow our affection because we're responding to him in this active way. Yeah, I think we can also just like take uh, a little solace in the idea that before the Lord, like like in Christ, really, our voices are angels. Hmm. Like even though we may sound like a frog (laughs) in actuality (laughs) as we stand shoulder to shoulder, um, but we can we can know and have full confidence in the finished work of Christ that when we worship God in song, that what He hears is is uh, you know this absolutely pitch perfect expression uh, because of what His Son has done on our behalf. I I uh, I mean obviously for me this topic feels pretty easy to engage just because I play guitar and I sing and this is part of my job here at the church, but. I know like for sure my voice is fine. Mm-hmm. Like I will like people will be like, Oh, you sing or or whatever and or they'll be like, Oh, you, you sounded great and I'll be like, I sounded fine. Mm-hmm. I know I like my voice is fine. It's not the most amazing voice, it's not the worst voice. It's a kind of a right down the middle of the road voice. <laughs> and what's so funny about saying that is that no one ever corrects me. No one's like, No, you have an amazing <laughs> voice. Everyone's like, You're right, it is, it's just fine, <laughs> which is great. I I'm totally content with that. But I can trust, regardless of how I sound, or regardless of like if I can sing or can't sing, um, I can know that um really before the Lord, uh I am heard because of what Christ has done. And Mm so um, I just want to engage with this thing that scripture is inviting me into. So Mm -hmm. this is the way, actually, I think this active worship, uh, adoration and action is the way that point one, what you brought up about worship manifesting itself in all of our living. This is how that actually happens. Unless we pull in both of these components, a thoughtful Uh, adoration, and then ask how this orientation towards God actually gets lived out in action, then I think we revert into manifesting something other than worship of God in our actions, as we were discussing a moment ago. Yeah. And some of that is just going to be like, probably so subtle, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's where really being intentional, being able to step back to assess like, what are the things I love? Like, like where, where am I invested? How are the, like, I think without kind of doing some of that introspective, like 
just make yourself available and open before the Lord, Mm -hmm. um, some of that stuff starts to creep in just because our lives are busy and our lives are full. And really, um, kind of the, the liturgy of our culture is not to orient you to God. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that is happening day to day is probably not taking you and saying, Hey, look to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so it it takes a real work to kind of slow down and kind of evaluate um, the things that are shaping your loves and the things that are shaping your heart. Hmm. It's extremely important then to remember, you mentioned this within sort of your explanation of this point to a moment ago, but that we do have a God who sent his son, that we have an incarnate uh, Jesus, who was divine and yet made the divine knowable to us and came to us. So that that sort of connectedness and the sort of holistic response of our lives is actually exemplified for us in the very person of Jesus. Yeah, it's it. It's a really beautiful way to kind of think about how it is that we engage with worship. Um, when we tend to read scripture, sometimes it can feel kind of detached from mm-hmm. the reality of life, or it, it can just feel like it lives in this place of like story, like it's over there. Mm-hmm. And yes, I believe it's true, but it it's sometimes it's hard to like bring it down all the way and remember like God is near in Christ, mm-hmm. um, that he is physical um, and so I, I love that, that kind of picture of Jesus, um, being present, um, and, and kind of the implications for us that we just, we don't just engage in thought experiments, mm-hmm. but that we really are engaging in, in worshiping God with everything that we have, our bodies, all of life. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, our bodies, our voices, and our heart and mind, that we are, as you said, holistically engaged in a response that is worshipful. Okay, so we moving on to number three. What else would you like to pull out of our initial definition? Yeah, so um, we've looked at a couple of things. The last thing that I want to talk through is this idea that it, worship is for the individual and together. Mm -hmm. And the quote from the definition says that worship, uh, both in the individual believer and in corporate worship, which is worship offered up in the context of the body of believers. It's in this last quote that we see a vision for worship that is both for the individual and for the church gathered. The gift of the church is a gift from God to his people. And it's here when we gather that we can live out Paul's exhortation to the early church in Colossians 3.16, where he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So we see Sunday worship services as a time to strengthen authentic worship throughout the rest of our week. Um, I have a quote here from the author and theologian Kent Hughes, and he says, through reading and preaching of God's word, through corporately singing the word, in hymns and spiritual songs, through corporately praying God's will, and through participating together in the Lord's table, that is communion, God's people will be encouraged and strengthened to live consecrated lives. He goes on to say that when you put all this together, people go on to live, quote, daily lives of profound worship. So it's this idea that we are worshiping God in all of life, that our worship is active. Uh, We do this as individuals. And, and yet there's this other piece, this other component, which is that we also worship together. Hmm. And it's not just kind of this construct of like, well, I guess we should just gather people um, like it's an HOA meeting or something <laughs> like that, that, that actually this is, this is purposeful. It's how God has intended his people to, to gather, to exist together and, um, that there's something that happens on Sunday morning that doesn't happen in any other part of our lives. And what happens on Sundays should root us um, and it should strengthen us and encourage us 
to go back out into kind of our Monday to Saturday mm-hmm. um, living lives of of profound worship, as Kent says in this mm-hmm. quote. So I think with this view of individual and together, we get a true sense of what um, it means to worship God. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to kind of be very brief with these three points, but my hope would be that people can kind of walk out of here or out of this conversation, taking away some handles. Mm -hmm. Worship is all of life. It's active and it's meant for us as individuals and it's meant for us to be experienced together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah. In the podcast, our overarching thing, not, not just for today's conversation, but for all of our conversations is to look for how God has revealed himself to us, where he is at work in the world and to ask him to open our eyes to his presence and his work. And then we align our lives, our actions, our understanding with that reality. And one way I think that's present here in what you're talking about, about the way we are created as individuals and corporately to worship um, points to this pattern that exists in the way God has structured everything we know about the universe and specifically what he has told us in his word. There's so much of how God made life that runs according to these rhythms that he has built into creation. We see this in the way we go about our day. We wake up, we go about our day, we sleep, we eat. All of these are cyclical and rhythmic, and we watch the sun rise in a sense. We know that it's because of the turning of the earth, but we watch the sun rise. We watch the sun set throughout the Bible. Various biblical authors point us to this as an example of God's faithfulness and mm-hmm. how he's designed the world and us. And then we think about how he uh, advised Israel and instructed them when he was establishing them as a nation he created within their actual time frames by which they ran so their weeks there were regular remembrances of him and then within their year there were celebrations annual celebrations that pointed to this greater reality of God's design his work on their behalf his sustenance of life and as i listen to you read this quote from Kent Hughes and then describe how our corporate worship actually fuels our individual lives and our individual worship. I think of that, that this points us to this reality, this rhythm of life that God not only created that we can observe, but that he actually instructed his people to also observe. Because in the remembrance of him in setting aside time that is specifically dedicated to learning, to singing, to serving, that in those moments that they point us back to this greater reality that then sustains our understanding, sustains our action, sustains this response of all of our life back to him in worship. Yes, that is great, Autumn. It's so well said. I think it would be amazing to talk more about this, but where I really want to leave off for today is kind of this idea of of thinking about what it looks like to worship together. Mm. And uh, next time when we chat on part two of this conversation, we'll be examining how is it that we here at Fellowship Denver think about our Sunday morning services. Mm -hmm. Um, We are responsible for this together piece uh, of the church. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of informs um, how it is that we put our service together, how it is that we think about Sunday serving, how it is that we come alongside one another and live out life as the church. And so I'd love for us to kind of hold and then save that for next time. I think there's a press lot pause. to press pause. <laughs> there's a lot to talk about there. Um, but I think we've we've dove into a lot today mm-hmm. and we've given ourselves a lot to consider. Yeah. And so um, do you want to, give folks a couple of recommendations 
um, for how to explore more on this topic or? Yeah. Um, thanks for joining me today, Adam. And we will pick up our conversation and key in on what you just said, that aspect of corporate worship, our gathered spaces, as we continue this conversation next week. And you mentioned a book earlier, uh, Worship yeah. by the Book. Worship by the Book. There's several contributors, um, D.A. Carson, Mark Ashton, Kent Hughes, Timothy Keller. Have you ever heard of that guy? <laughs> I so have, it's a really helpful resource, and I would re- I would strongly recommend it to anyone that wants to go further on this topic. And this book may be really helpful for developing a more theological understanding of worship. It is the book that you pulled that quote from Carson out of that we based today's episode around. Um, if you are interested in thinking about how a posture of worship and returning all of our lives in worship gets played out in daily life, I would recommend Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Harrison Warren as a great resource to read. Think more about that aspect of worship that we touched on today. So either of these resources are helpful if you're interested in reading and learning more about the topic that we just introduced today. It's really broad. What is worship? As you mentioned, Adam, is a pretty expansive topic and question, but I'm grateful that we got to discuss this aspect of it. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Thanks to Adam Englund for our theme music and to our producer, Jesse Cowan. 